Okay. Well, welcome everybody to tonight's um, Beach Nesting Bird Volunteer Training for uh, returning volunteers. Uh, we are so excited to have you guys all back this year. Um, you know, uh, before the, the call officially started, we were just saying how great it is that we have, we actually have a lot of returning volunteers this year, um, which is, is really awesome for our beach nesting birds. Um, so just uh, some quick introductions. Um, uh, my name is Corey Folsom O'Keefe. I'm the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut. Uh, and on the call today, we also have uh, Patrick Cummins, who's the Executive Director of the Connecticut Audubon Society. Um, Laura Saucier, who is the wildlife biologist for the DEP Wildlife Division. Scott Krubosh, who is our, our volunteer coordinator and who you have all interacted with um, on emails. And um, we've also got Beth Amendola, our pro coastal program coordinator. Um, you know, Beth runs our oyster catcher program. Martha Rice from the Nature Conservancy and Joe Atwater from the Roger Troy Peterson Estuary Center, which is a part of the Connecticut Audubon Society. Um, we are going to be um, just move my screen forward here if I can figure out how to do that. Okay, so now you can see tonight's agenda. Um, we're Laura's going to give us a quick uh, recap of the 2022 beach nesting birds season. Um, you'll get to hear about all the the efforts, all the results of your hard work. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about reported banned birds, and then I'll turn it over to Scott, who's going to talk about reporting and scheduling, submitting paperwork, picking up lanyards and badges, um, all the usual stuff. Uh, during um, the times that Laura's talking or Scott's talking or I'm talking, um, we're going to ask everybody to stay on mute. Uh, but if you have a question, by all means, put it in the chat and um, those of us on the call will try to provide an answer. Um, and then we can also pause after Laura's presentation, after my presentation, after Scott's presentation, and take a, a couple of extra questions. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and turn it over to Laura so she can uh, give you the results from this past season. Great. Okay. So hi. Good, good evening. <laughs> um, again, my name is Laura Saucier. I'm a deep wildlife di division biologist, and I work with uh, the piping, or I run the piping flow release turn project here at Deep. So um, I'm going to say first and foremost, thank you so much for coming back and um, helping us out again for another shorebird nest nesting season. Um, you know, every every year everyone gets a little bit better at this, so um, I certainly appreciate your your time and efforts this this season. So. Um, some folks may have tuned in and seen the results from last year. Um, so bear with me. Uh, I'm gonna go through them kind of quickly here. And I have a few extra slides at the end um, that have to do with monitoring. So that is my plan. And I'm pretty excited. We just got our power back a couple hours ago. So, um, so I can share this with you. So, all right. So in 2022, um, it was a really good year for both piping plovers and least turns. We had um, we had 66 pairs, which is again the highest pair total that we've ever had in Connecticut. And we've had two other years in the past where we have had um, that pair high. So that's pretty impressive. And we fledged 97 chicks which is a productivity of one and a half chicks per pair, which is pretty darn good for here in New England. Um, some of the highs and lows here, we had you know, early season storms that washed out string fencing and, and nests. Um, and then we had the Mother's Day storm that um, while it, it didn't hit us here in Connecticut, it really hit, um, places like Virginia and uh, New Jersey, their, their first wave of nesting got wiped out and they had heavy um, beach erosion down there too. So uh, Long Island Sound um, didn't get hit. So thank you, Long Island, for, for doing what you do, buffering us from these sorts of storms. Um, one interesting thing was that Sandy Point in West Haven had 20 pairs, which is pretty shocking given um, you know, that's a lot of birds packed into one site. And interestingly, 
in years past when we've had a lot of pairs there and we tend to see a lot of infighting between the pairs, you know, they are territorial birds. So um, they will, you know, fight amongst each other, um, if you will, um, for space and, and resources. Um, but this last year, excuse me, um, was a successful year down at Sandy Point. In Hammonasset State Park, um, the swimming beach, West Beach, successfully fledged one chick, which is shocking. And I'd like to give a special thank you to any, any folks that volunteered down at Hammonasset because that was, um, that is a busy beach. And it, I'm honestly shocked that we got a pair a pair of birds there and that they were actually successful. So, um, and in Connecticut, we tend to have this interesting phenomenon where we have um, high, like pairs will be very successful at small beaches. So we have like these small beaches where you'll have like one or two pairs and those tend to be very successful. You'll get, you know, all four chicks fledging versus these bigger sites like Sandy Point. Um, and we think that has to do with um, predation, you know, these places like Sandy Point and Milford Point, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of predators there. And um, so we think that these smaller beaches, um, you know, the, the birds will set up shop there and, and the predation pressure is just less there. So there was a 173 volunteer monitors last season with a whopping 13, 1,376 hours of effort which is amazing. Uh, one thing that we did have problems with um, in particular were fish crows being um, pretty aggressive. And, and um, really mm -hmm. as those chicks were hatching, we were seeing fish crows just picking them off as, as soon as they left the exclosure. So that's a little problematic and we're hoping to, I don't know, see what this year brings, but. So at the end, if anyone has any questions about a particular site, just let me know. So this is our um, productivity graph. Um, so you've got here the, um, the number of pairs, which is in this reddish color. You've got the uh, productivity of, of our birds in this purple color, excuse me. This yellow orangey line is um, what the Fish and Wildlife Service considers a stable population, which is a, popula a population that produces 1.2 chicks per pair during a nesting season for a certain period of time. And then we have this green line, which is, a, um, which is our productivity um, trend line from 1984 to 2022. And it's flat, which is, fascinating to me. Um, so even though we have more birds, we tend to have variable productivity, which kind of makes sense because um, we, do, we do very little predator management here in Connecticut. So, you know, there are going to be years where you've got problematic, you know, you've got a fox family that um, is denning nearby, or you have a, a coyote that's really um, figured out how to, you know, has keyed in on shorebirds. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't exactly know uh, what this means, but that would kind of be my take on it is that, um, well, again, we've got more pairs, we're seeing variable productivity, which is basically gives us kind of a, a flat line of, with productivity, but it's still good productivity. So um, can't complain about that. So some of the season highlights from last year, um, we have a new documented predator, which is the Atlantic ghost crab, which is, it's a native species um, to the south of us. So in, um, in the Southern states like Florida, South Carolina, that sort of thing, um, these are crabs that have been uh, documented um, being egg predators and also chick predators. And this species is moving north, um, likely with, with climate change. Um, and we found uh, a sighting of 
a ghost crab um, out at Bluff Point from a couple of years in 2020, I believe. And um, as we started looking, um, we started seeing some of this, these burrows, which um, are pretty diagnostic of this species um, on our eastern beaches. So it's something we're going to be keeping tabs on and, um, you know, just seeing if it spreads westward or not. And again, our ham and asset chick, um, well, actually there's two chicks in that photo, but that photo, but um, yeah, just you can see how busy it was behind that string fencing. So for, for those folks that are not really um, familiar with the, the ins and outs of piping plovers, um, piping plovers, um, there are three populations that make up, you know, the species as we know it here in uh, North America. And um, there's the Great, Great Plains, Northern Great Plains population, which is here, um, you know, on some of the, the major rivers in the Midwest. Um, you've got the Great Lakes population, which nests on the sandy beaches of the, the Great Lakes. And then we've got the Atlantic Coast population, which nests from North Carolina north up to uh, the Maritimes in Canada. So, and all three of these populations are, are thought to not necessarily interbreed much, and they, all three of them have different management uh, goals. So the Atlantic Coast population um, is the one that, you know, we belong to. And it, even the, our population is kind of broken up into management uh, units. You've got um, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. We make up the New England unit, recovery unit. New York, New Jersey is New York, New Jersey recovery unit. And then the Southern recovery unit is Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Virginia North Carolina, and they stick South Carolina in here in there because there's it's a big wintering um, uh, location for these birds. So the interesting thing is that um, while New England is doing New England is the stronghold of the Atlantic Coast population, we are doing we are doing great, and Massachusetts tends to be the state that really is um, is kind of propping up. Our numbers, whereas what we're seeing in New York, New Jersey, and the Southern Recovery units is that those two units are are not doing well. So while we can say it's great, you know, we're doing a good job, um, it's almost it's almost more important that we do a good job now because we are propping up the population. You know, you would think that if we're doing such a good job, we can kind of like back off a little bit, but um, I would argue that now we just full steam ahead and 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 keep keep on keeping on because um you know things are doing pretty well up here so um these <clears throat> turns um least turns in connecticut so very least turns are just such an interesting species to me um they are productivity is all over all over the place, and um, but these are long-lived birds. If I saw these productivity numbers, you know we've we have them you know all at, analyzed from like the 1980s till now. If I saw these numbers on any other species, I'd be freaking out because they're just you know up and down, up and down. Good years, bad years. Good years, bad years. Lots of birds, few birds. Um, because these birds are, are thought to live up to like 25, 30 years, um, they have a different kind of life strategy. They can, they can, um, they may not risk um, staying in an area where there's like high predation. So we've actually seen colonies just up and leave and I'll, contact my colleague in Rhode Island or in New York and say, hey, did you just get a bunch of turns show up? And they'll be like, yes or no. And uh, when it's yes, it's interesting because it's often about the number that left here. So um, these birds are just interesting in that sense. But um, we had a great year for these turns last year. Not necessarily, not necessarily numbers wise, 
but the productivity, like 0.85 is great. Um, oftentimes our productivity is more like 0 0.03, which um, birds prepare, <laughs> which uh, is not, not so great. Um, I wanted to thank you again for um, everyone's, not only you folks that are out there on the front lines um, doing your thing, but you know, also all of our conservation partners. It's really, it's really um, amazing to me how many people we have on board working on shorebird stewardship. It's just fantastic, and um, you know, we can't be as successful as we are without you um, and without each other. So thank you. So a little bit on the um, nuts and bolts here. I'm sure you've probably seen these slides before. Um, I should really try and get some new pictures, but um, you folks are gonna be helping us with monitoring. And um, again, why it's so important, you know, you're collecting data for us and um, just your presence out there while you're not law enforcement, it gives an enforcement presence and it gives, a, um, gives some credence to the, to the fact that these are protected species. So your presence out there, you know, you're the eyes, you're my eyes and ears. You're out there telling me when, you know, string fencing has been knocked down, when uh, bonfires have happened, when the dogs are, you know, off leash everywhere. You know, this is the sort of information that, that you folks are reporting to me, as well as, you know, the number of chicks you're seeing and, and the number of, um, birds you're seeing incubating and new nests and that sort of thing. It's, um, it's incredibly helpful. You also are giving like those educational opportunities. You know, many people show up at the beach and they think that beaches are for sand castles and volleyball and don't necessarily think about, you know, that there are birds that actually try, <laughs> that are actually trying to, to nest, you know, right on the sand. So it's an, it's an opportunity to educate folks that aren't normally at the beach. And you're offering um, additional presence and protection through these um, holiday weekends and special events like fireworks, where um, there's just a lot of people at the beach. And again, um, Connecticut meets our recovery goals most years um, because we have such a great crew of volunteer, volunteers and partners. And um, again, we get it done and we do well, and it's because of you all. Just one quick thing with regards to least turns. Um, if you're seeing least turns diving at your head, you're definitely too close to uh, either the string fencing or nests or chicks. Just a reminder. And again, here in Connecticut, our um, our message is, you know, share the beach philosophy, reminding people to respect our, our signs, our, our fencing, um, reminding people what the dog regulations are, talking to people positively about the birds, and uh, definitely, you know, the message that all these birds need is a little bit of time and space to raise their young tends to resonate um, quite a bit with, with families in particular. So I will again um, be interested in any piping plovers that you see that have bands on them, and you know certainly rep report them in your normal reporting method. But if you can shoot me an email with what you see, if you can get a photo, great. But if not, don't worry about it. If you can just um, if you can get eyes on the color scheme of on those birds, you know, whether they have like a green flag, which are these, um, they are these bands that are kind of on the upper part of the leg and they have a little tab that sticks out. They call, we call those flags. So um, if, if the band has a flag on it, usually those flags have numbers or letters on them. If you can see that and report that, that would be wonderful. And I'm just gonna quickly go over uh, being a good witness. Um, 
Unfortunately, our uh, law enforcement folks weren't able to make it tonight. So I'm just gonna go over this part um, for you. Certainly your safety is paramount. It's the most important thing. So, you know, if you see something happen, do not place yourself in a dangerous situation. If you feel you are in one, please just call 911. Um, if you're safe and you suspect that a person may be responsible for destroying or harassing adult piping plovers, nests, and or chicks, I, I would like you to contact our Connecticut uh, Deep Environmental Conservation Police and this number right here, which will be, it'll be in your paperwork and it's on your, your land, your, your badge, but it's 424-3333. That gets you to the dispatch center. And when you get through to them, you're going to have to explain that you are a deep shorebird volunteer and you are where you are, say I'm at Long Beach, and um, they're going to want to know what the situation is, like what's going on. So definitely be uh, ready to report that to the dispatcher. While you're there, um, if you can fill out an incident observation report, which is found in your uh, information packet, that is really helpful to law enforcement because it provides those details um, that will help them in their investigation. When you get home, um, if you can send me an email, that would be great just to let me know that there was an issue and that law enforcement was, was involved, if you know how it was resolved or not. Sometimes, um, you know, there's a Sometimes there's a disconnect between um, the biologist and the NCON officer. So it's just nice to know when something happens. And uh, remember, you know, none of us are law enforcement. So, you know, you want to consider your safety at all times. Um, it is the highest priority. So this is the incident observation form. Again, it's in your packet. Be sure to take that form with you every time you go out. So. The key to being a good witness is being observant and taking notes. And that incident observation form kind of walks you through, through this. Um, things like description of vehicles is helpful. Um, description of people, the date and the time of day, recording the exact time is helpful. Um, and certainly writing things out in longhand is, is good because you know that will help you jog your memory and also provides, you know, a narrative as to what happened. Locations and distances, if you can describe like how far you were versus how far they were, um, that, you know, an individual walked within five feet of a closed area and then proceeded to walk right, right into the string fenced area. Um, that gives a little, helps us understand perspective including weather conditions, you know, if it was a foggy day versus a sunny day, that is definitely important because it lends itself to like how visible um, conditions were. Um, and then certainly if something happened and there is a, a dead bird in that string fencing, do not disturb the crime, crime scene. Tracks in the sand are important to law enforcement um, and, you know, removing the carcasses or the eggs, um, you cannot do it. It's, it's authority has been given from the US Fish and Wildlife Service to the state to be in possession of those, um, of the carcasses or, or eggs or whatnot. Um, so please don't touch anything, just document as best you can. And certainly if a conflict or hostile situation arises, Try and diffuse the situation by identifying who you are as a, you know, Connecticut Deep Volunteer Piping Plover Monitor. Explain that you're observing the birds and collecting data for us. And if anyone has any questions that they can call me, and this is my phone number. Again, that'll be on your badge. It'll be in your paperwork. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. So just as a reminder, as a volunteer, you may relay beach regulation information such as areas that are closed or open and um, explain that dogs are not permitted on certain beaches during the nesting season. All that information is in your packet and um, never attempt to physically confront anyone or verbally give any commands or demand personal information from any beachgoers. 
again, you're not law enforcement, I'm not law enforcement, and we really don't want, um, we don't want to create situations. You know, we want people to have a positive interaction with us, and uh, we want them to uh, value the birds and see them in a positive light. So if someone is not receptive to what you have to say, just have a good day and, and carry on. So um, I don't know if I have any time for questions, but um, I'll leave that to Corey to tell me if I do. I'll give you one or two questions. Um, if anybody has a question and wants to unmute themselves, you can go ahead and do that. All right. If anyone has any burning questions, um, certainly at the end, I'm happy to answer something as anything as well. So I am going to stop sharing now. Okay. And I'll, I'll share my screen again as soon as you're down. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to give some, some quick stats on uh, oyster catchers from 2022 and then uh, just let you guys know about how you can report report oyster catcher uh, banded oyster catchers um so in 2022 we had 100 pairs of oyster catchers um 79 of which we were able to confirm um that they were breeding um basically somebody saw them with a nest or a chick that's how we confirm breeding um and those 79 predators produced 62 fledglings for a productivity of 0.78 uh, fledglings per pair. And uh, similar to um, piping plovers, uh, Connecticut really leads the pack um, in productivity for oyster catchers. We have one of the highest productivity rates along the entire Atlantic coast. And uh, so we are, you know, uh, the numbers, the number of chicks that we're producing in Connecticut is really helping to grow the population uh, within the state and then probably beyond the state as well. Similar to past years, um, a lot of our birds are on islands, about 79%. Um, and that is because on the islands, they typically have less human disturbance um, and predation, and as a result, have higher productivity than on the mainland sites. Um, that said, the mainland did okay last year. Um, it had a productivity of uh, 0.5 fledglings per pair, um, which is up from um, 0.15 fledglings per pair in 2021. So um, you know, definitely a, a, a better year on average um, in on the mainland um, than uh, some of the other years in the past. We also are continuing to ban American oyster catchers. And um, uh, between 2018 and 2022, um, we have banned at 62 American oyster catchers. Um, so they've got their um, uh, metal USGS band, uh, and then they also have their um, yellow uh, sort of field readable bands. And um, of those 62 birds, 45 are adults, um, which makes up 28% of the breeding population. Um, and, uh, you know, having those adults uh, banded, you know, especially the ones on the mainland sites where you guys are monitoring, it actually is, makes it easier for you to tell the birds apart because um, you can actually see, you know, one of the birds in a pair or both of them might have bands um, that are field readable. So you can actually um, track individual birds, um, you know, versus sort of, maybe, you know, guessing is this this pair or, you know, that pair, it is kind of makes it a, a little bit easier to keep track of these birds. And uh, we were also able to ban 17 fledglings over the course of those four years with a lot of those fledglings being banded in 2022. Um, and from this uh, information, we are learning a lot about the movements of these species. Um, uh, via banding birds, we've been able to identify uh, three main uh, staging areas, uh, one at Milford Point, one at Coquini Island, and another one at Monongatesic Island. And um, we've also learned that um, of, you know, of those 62 or 40, uh, 45 banded adults, 15 of them, so uh, uh, is that 33% of them, have uh, either changed breeding sites or changed mates over the past four years, um, or both. Um, there was a time period where we thought that our oyster catchers, uh, you know, kind of stuck with the same mate and nested in the same area year after year after year. And we're finding that that isn't quite the case. Um, one thing we're also sort of thinking about uh, the staging areas is that, um, you know, where birds choose to stage might be a function of, uh, you know, where they, um, you know, where they, where their, their parents nested. Um, and, per, you know, and where that chick fledged from. So uh, one thing that we had happen in this year was um, back in 2020, there was a pair of chicks that were banded at Milford Point, And one of those birds returned this year. 
um, after spending uh, time in South Carolina um, to uh, join the flock at Milford Point in July, and it stayed at Milford Point until September. So this is a two-year-old bird, not ready to breed yet. Oyster catchers tend to breed more around three or four years of age, um, but it, you know, made the made the trip up to Milford Point to sort of uh, join the flock there and stage there in the fall. So um, maybe there is um, so the, the the history of where a bird uh, originated, you know, might uh, play a role in which areas it tends to stage. So just some some cool insights. Uh, last thing I want to say is that uh, just a reminder, you know, so if you see these banded oyster catchers, um, you can mention them in your um, notes when you submit your Google form or eBird surveys, um, but you can also report them to the American Oyster Catcher Working Group, um, which is amoywg.org. And on that site, um, you can actually have a list of like my banded oyster catchers. And if you sort of submit data on an oyster catcher, um, it will actually tell you where it was originally banded, um, you know, where it has been seen in the past. Um, so you can kind of learn a little bit more about uh, those individual oyster catchers, um, you know, from submitting data to the AMOYWG page. Um, and I'm also just going to quickly field a question that was in the chat. Um, some of you may know that uh, there is some legislation that the is being considered by the Environmental Committee now in Hartford. It's a Bill HB 6813. And um, this is an act concerning the protection of certain uh, seabirds and shorebirds. It's a legislation that Audubon, Connecticut um, developed uh, with input from uh, Connecticut Audubon Society, the DEP, um, you know, all the, our other partners who are on the call here today. And uh, basically what that legislation would do is it would say that the areas where the state puts up string fencing are the official sort of shorebird protection areas. And um, what it would do is it would make it an infraction for an unauthorized individual to go into the string fencing. Um, and it would also make it an infraction for someone to uh, bring a dog uh, or any pet um, or drive a vehicle or bicycle within 100 feet of the string fencing. Um, as you all know, um, you know, uh, pets and, and vehicles can be really dangerous um, to our, our threatened bird species. It, uh, if you think about it, one person chose to bring a dog uh, to a nesting site in the middle of July. Um, you know, they, if it's one of our more productive nesting sites, they're putting 20 to 30 uh, chicks potentially in danger. Um, so we want to um, give the NCON officers, um, as well as our local PD, a tool that they can use um, to be able to enforce um, rules about dogs, other pets, and vehicles that are typically already in place um, at these nesting sites. So if anybody has additional questions about that, um, you know, feel free to, to throw it in the chat. I'd be glad to answer more questions. Um, that bill uh, has had a public hearing with the Environmental Committee, and hopefully... Fingers crossed, um, it'll pass out of the Environmental Committee sometime uh, this week or next week. So fingers crossed, um, there could be an action alert that goes out um, in a week or two, or maybe a week or two after that. Um, just, and if uh, you see the bill and you see the action alert and wanna support it, um, you know, the more voices, the better. So uh, with that, I'm gonna take down my uh, screen and uh, give Scott the opportunity to uh, pull up his screen. As you know, I'm Scott Krupash, the volunteer coordinator of the Audubon Alliance for Coastal Waterbirds. And what I want to emphasize more than anything is that for the most part, all the monitoring procedures and practices are the same. So if you have done this for a long time, done this for a couple of years now, it's basically all the same process. So I will go over it as we go through this. And your volunteer responsibilities are, as always, to observe and collect data for piping plovers, American oyster catchers, least turns and common turns. We want you to visit your beaches or beach at least monthly or a few times a week. And just keep in mind some sites you might have to walk several miles like Bluff Point and, and Long Beach and Pleasure Beach. If you combine those, those are quite a walk. We ask that you report disturbances like abandoned nests, loose dogs, excessive trash, how many people are visiting, signs of predators, like the bobcat that was behind me, uh, direct threats or takes. Obviously those as well will go to Deep and Laura. Uh, we're gonna educate our beachgoers with kindness always and positivity about the nest, young, what goes on on the beach, dog leash laws. We've already been doing that at Milford Point while there's piping plovers and oyster catchers there now. We're already having loose dogs out there, so we're working on it. Uh, we wanna not, um, 
leave our trash on the beach and make sure that just people give the birds a lot of space. And we will let you know as we go through the year about assisting with special events from string fencing and signage uh, to the census in June, fireworks displays, beach cleanups, and distributing literature. <clears throat> we want to, at all times, be in professional behavior in dress and appearance, wearing a shirt and our deep badges. We want to make sure that our liability forms are filed deep. Um, and just keep in mind that we ask while you're volunteering, there's no alcohol or smoking or swimming or sunbathing, fishing. Those are all fine things to do on your time, but just while we're volunteering, we want to focus on monitoring and educational outreach. And that's because our performance as uh, monitors on the beach will affect the public perception of not only what we're doing, but just wildlife, endangered species, and conservation on the whole. If you have somebody rude, you know, things have been a little crazy even more since the pandemic, of course, just say, hey, have a good day and keep it going. We don't need to interact for prolonged periods with anybody who is, uh, you know, being rude or, or cruel in any way. And just bear in mind that Again, social distancing and private space, while we largely have moved out of the pandemic, it's still very important to give people a little extra room. Before we go monitoring, we want to make sure we check the weather, stay home if there's snow, rain, threat of thunderstorms. Um, just also please stay home most of the time. Um, if it's cooler than 50 or hotter than 90, especially once the birds are nesting, you know, in the early season, if you go out in the morning, birds are just setting up like on April 2nd, it's a little chilly. That's all right. But we want to make sure that we're watching the weather. And if we stay home too, and it's very significant wind, if you feel it blowing you over and blowing sand in your face and debris all over the place, it's a good time to just stay home. Make sure you bring your deep badge, binoculars, or spotting scope, uh, phone, notebook, outreach materials. You might also want sunblock, water or snack, insect repellent, backpack, hat jacket, gloves, camera with a good long zoom lens that can help a lot and to wear strong sneakers or boots. And if you're uh, in, injured or you have a surgery upcoming or you're recovering or if you're ill, just please let me know and stay home and you know, take it easy and stay safe. And you wanna keep avoiding days like this at Long Beach, which is very pretty, I shot from the car, but that's the day we're gonna turn around. And that was years ago with the piping plovers in the snow. I was hoping to get some this week, but unfortunately we couldn't quite get that crazy snow to the coast. Monitoring procedures are largely the same, and the electronic data form in ctwaterbirds.blogspot.com, you know, all of you know it pretty well. Uh, it's basically the same. I did make a couple little changes that you can put your email address in there, and it should be easier to update it. If you have something that you wanted to alter in a report or amend, um, that should be easier to do now yourself, but you can always ask me as well. Just shoot me an email, and I can change anything that you need. Um, you're going to just you know, once you get to monitoring, scan the beach from afar, walk by the water, keep your eye out for birds, especially piking plovers, so you don't disturb them or agitate them. And, you know, all of you are real experts at this, but we still want to make sure that we stay out of string fencing areas. Uh, we do the same thing. It's very rare that any one of us goes in to, um, because people will see that and people will do it and they'll think it's fine then for them to do the same thing. Uh, and just try to, again, stay near the water in the area of wet sand, uh, we don't need to go into the dunes or look at nests or egg count turns or even turn nest counts. We don't necessarily need all that data. We want to make sure the birds are safe. And again, this was an example that I showed, especially for new folks um, by the water. This couple's walking below the rack line, which is near their knees, so they're okay. And the piping plover is in the exposure in the center on the ground. And that's all we really need to see is the piping plover is on its nest incubating. That's great. And we can just keep moving. So we'll record that focal species behavior and breeding status, whether it's a pair, birds foraging, courtship or copulation, an adult on the nest like that, pairs, et cetera. Keep in mind that the adults might lead us away from the nest, especially before they're exposed or when they're young and they're just recently hatched running around the beach. You might see the alarm calls and broken wing displays. And we just wanna make sure we exit that area slowly and quietly. We wanna, Keep in mind everything Laura said about terns dive bombing us and again, making sure that the birds are the priority. Uh, minimizing our time around the nest is really important. All of you, again, are really good at this and you know this. Um, and cameras and phones help record a lot, but we just want to be aware of the people and the birds. 
And just, I would say to that, we see frequently, you know, I'm a professional photographer. We love photography. We love taking pictures, but it's something that we want to work on outreach too, is we see a lot of people who just kind of camp out by the birds with cameras all day or sit in the middle of areas where terns are trying to nest and that can be problematic. So we want to keep an eye on that too. I'm not saying that it's necessarily all of us, but it's beach visitors. And that's what we want to keep an eye on because we have all the little plovers about, and then we have all the piping plover adults getting rather agitated like that. And we, you know, don't need those turn egg counts. You can, if you see a nest of piping plovers and it's a new nest and it hasn't been exposed and you're from, a, still from afar, that's fine, but we don't need people to approach. And especially once they're exposed, they're all set. If you find a new nest, just please don't mark it or approach it too closely. Just let us know via email, CTD and AFCW. ASAP while describing the landmarks that are around the nest, everything that's there. You don't want to place anything because that will tip off predators, people, and more. If the nest is abandoned or destroyed, just tell us again directly via email, in deep via email, as soon as you can when you get back. Um, and just keep noting the predator signs and tracks. Um, Laura covered some predator information. All of you have seen the fish crows, the fox, the cats, the dogs, all of it. And we just need, really need to stay on top of that as much as we can. You know, people frequently say to me, they're not going to, they think cats won't take a bird or eggs or nest. Well, if cats will take a cottontail like that. They will, I promise you, take anything that they can. And you might see a little fox buried in the grasses like this in the dune or grasslands nearby besides walking the beach. And it's just good to note. Uh, like I've said, and like you know, the bird safety is paramount, data is secondary, we're all out there. The reason we have so many volunteers and we want to have so many volunteers is that everybody is out there seeing everything and we have our great staff. There's a lot of folks who are visiting a lot of times and we're all going to get different data, but the priority is still bird safety. So we, that's why we have so many people because we'll put the data together. And we have to keep in mind that while we're doing this and we're all great at it and experienced that we can still be a big disturbance no matter what, especially tighter places like the photo at uh, Sandy Moore's Points in West Haven. Walking by, you can see a plover is just right between the small amount of sand that's between the water and the dune and nesting areas. And that's just what happens. But if you see suspicious behavior from people or suspect somebody's responsible for harassing or nest or chicks or herding eggs, Follow the good witness guidelines, fill out the paperwork, call and call deep NCON police as soon as you can. You know, just keeping in mind that we're not law enforcement as much as we do this. We're here to call law enforcement, to call animal control. And the more we can do that and document and record, that is all that's really the most important things for us to do. Um, relaying the information in a positive and friendly way to people on the beach. Again, the more that of us that are doing so in a kind and caring and good way, realizing that, you know, with, whether it's there with their kids or they're with their dog and it's a special time for them, but just being kind about it. And if that, anything else comes from that, if it gets hostile, just say, hey, have a good day and keep moving. Laura mentioned, um, and well, Corey as well, about all of our abandoned and flagged birds. That's 5E, pink flagged at uh, West Haven. It's N14 at West Haven. And again, you can record these things, but just please do record them. Kind of like the photo I have here. This is very cropped. You can see it's very zoomed. It's in the dune and, and uh, um, below the rack line towards the water. And that's fine to do it like that. Uh, the monitoring schedule is about the same as always. The official monitoring takes place April 1st through August 31st. If you're already going visiting your beach and you want to submit some data on your time, by all means, that's totally fine. Um, our staff is out there basically watching things, full-time staff and then seasonal staff from February through October. Um, our greatest need, as always, is the busiest beaches during the highest traffic times and weekends, holidays, beach weather when school ends. You can sign up for everything as always at ctwaterbirds at gmail.com with your requested, requested schedule, dates for days of the week, AM or PM and beach selection. Please just let me know as soon as you can what you'd like to do. We do really need to have at least an outline of the schedule. It's fine if you have to change days or shift or if you're not sure you can make it all the time. Just give me please as much information as you can because that way we can evenly distribute people across the times and make sure then 
uh, behind the scenes that we're moving our staff around to the appropriate beaches at the right times. And that way we have knowledge of who's where, when, in case there's a bad weather event, uh, some kind of large disturbance, something having to do with law enforcement, it really helps. And please, if you can submit your schedule by April 1st, and just let me know if you need to cancel, change, whatever through the whole year, just email ctwaterbirds at gmail.com as soon as you can. Data submission is still right through the online data submission form on the blog, ctwaterbirds.blogspot.com. And the link is still in the upper right hand column, the upper right hand column, which is under important documents, but you have to view it on a computer typically. Enter all the required fields that you can and leave blank anything that's not necessary, like right now, uh, young birds, of course. More documents and pertinent information can be found there. Laura is going to send me more uh, documents and info for the year. We're all going to put up everything from the whole thing and get it set. Uh, you can do shore bird surveys, turns, long leg waders, all that sort of thing on your own time at different beaches, wherever you want in the state. Um, anywhere in the state, if you have any of those species, by all means, just share it on eBird with the share function uh, to ctwaterbirds at gmail.com. That helps us just track hours and other information and other you know, species sightings across the state that go outside of our focal species. And for our focal species and our online data submission form, please submit that as soon as you can when you return from the beach. The sooner we have the information, the more we can analyze it, check out oh, was there a lot of disturbance going on there today? Did the tide hurt any of the nests? And that sort of thing. And just examples of our other birds, you know, stilt sandpipers for shorebirds, a royal tern for more uh, tern sightings, green heron, any of those, any terns, herons, and shorebirds, just share with eBird whenever you want, no rush on that. That was always really helpful. Monitoring locations are, as always, um, Priority beaches being Long Beach and Stratford, Milford Point and Milford, Sandy Morse Points in West Haven, and Bluff Point and Groton. Other beaches include Griswold Point and Old Lyme, Hammond Asset Beach State Park in Madison, Short Beach in Stratford, Pleasure Beach in Bridgeport, Comfortable Beach in Westport, Silver Sand State Park in Milford, and Sherwood Island State Park in Westport, Russian Beach in Stratford, Milford and West Haven beaches that you know occasionally get birds, uh, some of the smaller areas like Waterford Town Beach. And the offshore islands and other local beaches, beaches and marshes that some of you might visit sporadically or live near or have some family by, we can also include that on a case-by-case -case basis. But all of you are pretty familiar with this. Um, these are just quick maps of our sites, Bluff and Watertown and Griswold. Hammond Asset, we monitor the public beach area uh, on the left and the west side of the beach there, not the natural area preserved. We monitor the public beach. West Haven, uh, San Diego Morse Point, sometimes some neighboring beaches on Beach Street. Same for Milford at Silver Sands, occasionally we may have some action at Trumbull, Fort Trumbull Beach. Milford Point down to Short Beach, around the corner to Russian Beach, Long Beach and Pleasure Beach in Bridgeport. Sherwood Island State Park in its beach, plus Campo Beach. And of course, we are going to be giving you badges. Now your badges can be picked up at a, a number of locations, including the Milford, uh, the Connecticut Audubon Society Center at Milford Point. And there are the hours, the Roger Tory Peterson Estuary Center in Old Lyme. And those are those hours. If you feel like stopping by uh, new volunteer field training, whether you want to, you can always certainly attend the training. But if you just like to stop by um, around 10 or around 12, when we're getting ready to head out to the beach or coming back from the beach, you can uh, take a moment to give Laura and Rebecca your waiver for deep. We can give you a badge and a lanyard if you need it. That's a really good time to meet up quick and exchange everything. Otherwise, if you live quite far from these places and, you're, and you know, your beach isn't by one of them and you can't make it to these stops or uh, the field training, then we can see about mailing. And again, we'll talk questions in a moment, but keep in mind to contact Deep Encon police immediately if you have takes, uh, birds being harassed or attacked by people, and of course, call 911 for emergencies. Email ctdeep and wildlife at ctwaterbirds at gmail.com. ASAP about new nest, damage, fencing, or signage, predated or lost nest, injured birds, and please email Laura and Rebecca directly, personally as well. And email ctwaterbirds at gmail.com with really anything else that you have, uh, basic questions about 
scheduling, monitoring, bird ID assistance, about paperwork, data entry, weather, predators and people, RSV for fencing dates, show pictures or video, any or all of it, just ctwaterbirds at gmail.com. It's still the place for everything. And with that, just thanks everybody. We've already had a lot of bird sightings and birds. I've been out there looking at them and I know some of you have, we can't wait. Um, so I do see one question in the chat, and I, I think this is probably a Laura question. Uh, when will badges be available at Milford Point? Um, I have not printed them yet. <laughs> so I'm thinking um, probably the beginning of April. So I'll try and have those available um, as of beginning of April. And certainly if you if you want a refresher course on how to uh, monitor, we're gonna be doing our, our training again, probably at Sandy Point on April 15th. Obviously, if you're a seasoned veteran, um, this would not apply to you, but if you um, if this is like maybe your second year and you, and you wanna refresh yourself, um, we'll be sending out some information about that. But I will have badges at that training. Um, but, um, like I said, I think I'm going to try and have them all printed up by hopefully like the week of April 3rd. Yeah, so right around when monitoring starts, we'll have everything. And in the meantime, we have a couple of weeks. We we're a little early this year, which is good. So we have a couple of weeks to schedule everyone. We're going to send out, I will email out these pre this presentation, new monitor uh, training. We'll email these out to you again so you can watch them or review them. We're going to send out uh, documents that Laura has for deep. Uh, your waiver form and that sort of thing, uh, the usual informational packets. So we'll put that out on email and put that in the blog and get it all set. Okay, hey, um, I also noted, you know, another thing that you could pick up when you swing by Milford Point or the Rogerstory Peterson Estuary Center, if you come to the field training on April 15th, um, would be uh, brochures. And uh, we have brochures, all of our brochures at this point are in Spanish and English. Um, so while we don't necessarily have um, Spanish signs that we can put up um, at, you know, our beaches, like say Sandy Point, for example, we certainly have brochures that are in Spanish that you guys are welcome to take, you know, a handful, 25, 50, um, and give them out when you are out on the beaches. Yep. Yeah, and um, we've been working on trying to get some created. It's been, I think I've said that for like, I don't know, the past five years, but um, it's a work in progress. Um, but hoping to submit that uh, to our purchasing department um, shortly. Yeah, we will get those brochures distributed so that there's you know, a stash at Milford Point, that there's a stash at Roger Trapeze and Estuary Center, um, you know, maybe other locations as well as the season goes on, but um, definitely make sure that those are available. Uh, I'm sure that um, once the lanyards and brochures and things get dropped off at the appropriate location, Scott will send out a blast to everybody and, and let folks know. Yeah, most definitely. We'll just keep updating you with it all. Um, and hopefully we can, I, I think it's all going to come together well right around, you know, April 1st and we'll be in good shape. And if you have your lanyard from last year, if you can, um, if you can bring it, you know, if you, can, if you held on to it, that's great because yeah. it's, you know, that many less that I have to purchase. Yeah, if you can recycle your lanyard and just take yeah. out your badge and pop a new one and that's awesome. Exactly, exactly. The bobcat behind me was in Stratford. And we have had bobcats on our um, beaches all the way to the shore too. Laura, there's a question about um, what beaches are fish crows causing a problem at, or at least where did they cause problems in 2022? Um, definitely the Eastern beaches. And um, I wish Rebecca was on cause she would, she would know this like that, but um, definitely um definitely eastern beaches and i was um i was at one of the beaches and um i was kind of shocked a bit as to how kind of bold they were i was trying to shoo them along and they would they did not they were not concerned about me at all so they're um they're bold and and they're smart and um they seem to kind of they can definitely hone in on um, the that chicks are hatching and just wait and um, grab them as they come out of the exposure. So it's certainly a learned behavior. Um, 
They're smart. Yeah, we've had some fish grow issues in Milford and Stratford at times as well. I don't know if I'm, you know, I mix a lot of years up. I basically just remember this as the past 12 years of working on this as one, but they will sit on the nest or sit on the exposures and basically park and wait there for chicks to hatch. It's really messy. And a good question, I should have mentioned that, thank you, Bob, is uh, parking passes for something like Sandy Morse points, um, as I, I said in the email, but here, just please, you know, if you're going to work at West Haven, send me your mailing address, please, your vehicle make and model, um, color, your basic info in your license plate. If it's Connecticut, just the license plate's fine. If it's out of Connecticut, please let me know the state too. And that process, then hopefully we can do that within the next few days or week, and I could submit that. And then it's up to West Haven and the city of West Haven, how fast they can turn that around, submit them, take them, uh, print them and mail them. And that can be difficult, um, but that is certainly out of our hands at that point. Um, we try to expedite that as much as possible because we want you to have them because we want you there and you're doing a great service and we need them as well as staff. We need the parking passes too. So I will push as much as I can for them to be uh, in our hands as soon as possible in April. Let's see. Um, yeah, people are reminding me of some of the other places we've had fish crow um, problems with yeah. too. Um, it's tough because yeah, you you know you have trash. You it's very difficult because when you don't have any receptacles for trash, people just trash everywhere, and that's a different problem. When you have receptacles, then people bring the trash in, and then and invariably they become overflowing uh, piles of garbage because the cities don't clear them. And then that's another problem. So it's really something that the garbage should be filled and then emptied every day or two, but we know how that can go. Um, we, we try, I promise we try, we push. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, I think because they're so darn, so darn smart, um, uh, I've seen them at beaches where, you know, trash isn't an issue. They just have cued in on um, yeah. these exclosures. And um, like you said, Scott, they just sit on the exclosure and wait. Um, yeah, literally sit on the literally, exclosure. literally, they and have basically a calendar too, and they know when. And it's it's unbelievable. They're very smart, and and that's the same problem with you know Laura talks about deep will expose some uh, pike and clover nests, but not all, because sometimes you have beaches where a fox is very smart and they know to find the exposure or this or that, and they they hone in on it. So you've got to pick and choose. Yep. And, um, you know, we, like I said before, we don't do much predator management in Connecticut because it's, um, it's expensive and it's, um, quite frankly, a lot of people don't have the, people don't, like that. people don't necessarily want to kill other animals, even if, you know, their endangered species are eating other endangered species. Um, and I get that. Um, so, and crows are even more of a, a difficult predator to, um, to deal with, even we, even if we did have um, the will to do predator management for fish crows, it essentially is, um, you know, shooting crows. So, um, and that's difficult to do on beaches, you know. Well, uh, at least uh, for you know, Audubon's, Connecticut Audubon, DEP. Nature Conservancy, um, we just a giant thank you to all of you again for your continued um, help uh, managing and monitoring our, our beach nesting bird species. Um, we really could not do this without you. Um, you know, you guys are incredibly important to this work. And, uh, you know, every bird that fledges from these beaches, you know, you, you are a part of making that happen. So thank you. And um, we will be in touch. See you on the beach. Thank you, everybody. We'll talk soon.